Um, I was I was uh, wondering how to talk about your book because we've talked about it so much in the previous interview we did. Uh -huh. Yes. So it will be a different twist. Fine. Uh, instead of just uh, going through the whole book, I have some specific questions that would allow you to talk about the book, if, okay. if that suits you. No problem. Okay. okay, so let's do it very formally. <laughs> Hello, Nigel. How are you today? Hi, Francois. It's very nice to talk to you. It's very late here, so I'm slightly tireder than I would have been <laughs> had it been earlier, but I'm fine. I'm really good. Thank you. I'm very honored to talk to you again. It's been uh, a few weeks since we've talked last time and had uh, the chance to reread uh, your Learning Challenge book. Thank you. And I say reread because I loved it the first time and I enjoyed it even more the second time. Good. That prompted me to ask you different questions than maybe a first reader would. Uh, the, the, the book is divided into three parts. Can you tell me rapidly, you know, you said the first part is a manifesto for change. Yes. The second part is new ideas for learning. Yes. And the third part is the game changers. Yes. Uh, how did you structure it? Why did you do it that way? What was the, the, the need that you tried to fulfill? I wish I could say that that's how it started and that's the way it was. <laughs> The truth is that when I'd, I'd written 10 chapters, um, I was working with the publisher and the publisher said, Nigel, it just seems very random. What is the logic for having chapter two next to chapter three, <laughs> chapter four next to chapter five? She said, you could, you could shuffle it around and it wouldn't make any difference. And she said, where is the structure in this book? And I said, well, you know, you're right. And she said, uh, let me think about it. Let me think about it. Anyway. The next day or the day after, she said she'd been lying in bed thinking about the book and the structure came to her. She just said, it's in three parts. So she came back to me and said, you know, there's the context. You know, that's the first part. Then there are the, the, the things that are happening now. That's the second part. And then the, the game changes, the things that will happen in the immediate future. That's the third part. Don't you think that's better? And, and we just went, yes. And it, it fell into place. That was exactly right. She was fantastic. So I wish I could say that I had an unbelievably brilliant idea from the very beginning about the structure. The truth was the structure actually came at the end. And, it, and, it, and it is, it's such a logical structure. I can't think of any other way of doing it than the way it is. But it's a great that, collaboration with your editor. Oh. <laughs> Ironically, I shouldn't be admitting this really, but it's true. Well, that's, that's good. And it clarifies, at least for me, the role of the editor. Yes, exactly. I, I had a very good relationship with the, the, the editor. She was excellent, really good, very helpful. Okay, then that clarifies also the way I will ask you a few questions about the whole thing. Yeah. Uh, about the context, Manifesto for Change, the role yes. of the, the uh, learning leader. Yes. The one thing that strikes me, I was recently reading a LinkedIn group, a LinkedIn discussion group, and the question was, you know, what is the, the, the main challenge for a trainer today or yes. a training leader? Yes. And one of the things that dawned on me is how to influence the environment around him or yes. her. Yes. And how do you go about influencing uh, the CEO and the CFO? Because it's, training is always perceived as an expense. Yes. How do you influence people? Because reading your book, it's very, very clear that something has to change, yes. something has to be done, yes. and the training leaders are frequently aware of this. Yes. So how do you go about influencing people yeah, around you? Right. And it's, that in itself is a topic that I've addressed a number of times with, with individuals and groups. I, the first thing, I think there are, there are kind of three key messages. The first one is that it's not all about you. Uh, you you've got to get rid of your jargon, get rid of your obsession with you know, learning and learning being something special and unique and you know, forget about that. Uh, the second thing is you've got to start focusing on the big issues for the organization. So if you have no idea what keeps the CEO up at night, then you're never going to play, play in, in that game. You're never going to play in that game. And the third thing is the willingness to be accountable. So the, the willingness to, to say, yes, I'm responsible for that budget and this is what you get for it. So that, that attempt to measure the impact 
uh, not necessarily in crude R ROI to terms, but to measure the impact of what you're doing. And to measure that impact, not around learning, but around the organization. This is how we've helped change this organization. These achievements wouldn't have been possible without this contribution from learning. So it's slotting yourself into the bigger picture. And the other thing that I say to people is that we need volunteers in this world. And if you're a learning leader who's being completely ignored, passed over, not seen as a player, start to intervene, start to offer to join a task group. Um, and, and when you're there, offer the learning frame. You know, show how the frame for learning is a, is a really useful insight into the way organizations work. Now, for example, so many organizations run massive change programs and they, and they seem to think it's got nothing to do with people. It's all to do with process. <laughs> it's not true. You won't make it work without focusing on people and what people need to know and understand and the skills they need to acquire in order to be able to work in that world and alleviate some of the fear that, that, that stops people and paralyzes people from change. So you've got to be a player in a bigger picture than learning but make sure that you deliver the learning element in, in, in a really powerful and integrated way. So you're asking a fantastically important question. And it's, it's not an easy, an easy answer. It's not something that you can just say, oh, I'll do that. It's actually a long-term game or a medium-term game. You, you, you make your steps, you start moving along that route, and you begin to play in a bigger, a bigger area and you begin to take on some of those responsibilities and you begin to uh, uh, basically influence more, more of the organization in the way that you want. So see it as a, you know, as a one year play, not as a two week play. I was interviewing an operations VP a few years ago and I asked him, how can I get in touch with your colleagues at the VP level? Yeah, And he told me, you need to talk about culture change quickly. I said, oh, my God, these words don't fit together. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> but one thing that I really love about your book is that at the end of each chapter, there's a section called Where to Start. Yes. And you propose a series of action that a yes. learning leader could actually yes. do. And they are all pretty easy to do. Yes. It, needs, it, needs, it requires courage. Yeah. And, and, and diligence and yeah. persistence, but they're pretty easy. But we need to have the vision. Yes. And I think in, uh, in one context. of your... And the context. That's Very it. Important. But yeah, uh, again, one of the, the key underpinning logic in the book was help people. Don't just make them feel small or make them feel daunted or overwhelmed. Help them. And therefore... Think about these, answer these questions. Look at this checklist. These are the ways to start. That was definitely a, an integral part of the, the message that I wanted to, to give people. And you have a definition of performance that I just love. You say that performance is to help individuals to solve their own problem. Yes. Basically, go back to the individual. How, what can I do for these people yes. to actually solve their own problems? Yes. And... and that is, is quite an insight because today most people will go to YouTube to solve their own problems. Yeah. And especially young people, they're so into this, YouTube yeah. or other social media thing. So it's very, very dynamic. It changes every day. Yeah. They go there and the most recent video is maybe the best one. Maybe not, but at least it changes. Yeah. So they've got access to everything. Yes. And then you, you compare it goes to elements. It and don't resist it and don't ban it. And the number of yeah. organizations that ban YouTube because why do they ban YouTube? Because people use it. People use it because it's useful. Uh, yeah. And maybe a few people watch stupid, stupid YouTube videos with cats, but the vast majority of people are watching YouTube videos to help themselves and solve their own problems. I think you yeah. should enable that. You know, the, the, oh, sure. it's no longer a, a world of learning where the learning leader stands at the door as the guard. The learning leader is the, you know, the orchestra conductor, the, the, the traffic got the traffic warden who not traffic warden the traffic policeman saying you go this way you go this way here come on hurry up come on come on it's it's a helping facilitating guiding 
consultancy role, yeah. not a controlling uh, and stopping, preventing uh, and, and constricting role. It's very, very important, that distinction. You've just described a typical LMS then. Yes, <laughs> I, I will. That's true. Yes, I know. But you know, so this is the new dynamic the LMS. I say to people is, you know, get over your LMS. Don't, don't, blame, don't blame your LMS for all the things that learning doesn't do. Now, I, I, and you can be deeply frustrated by the LMS, but get over it. There's lots of other things you can do. That, that, yeah. that, that, that the LMS is not going to influence one way or the other. No, and you mentioned, and I noted down, I just wrote it down on page 117, user experience is paramount. Yes. And LMS is just the other way. I mean, this is a, just the way not to go. Yes. In every mean. Yes. It's slow, exactly. it's static, it's constricted, yeah. it's restricted, it's limiting. Yeah. And, and you've got YouTube on one side, the LMS on the other. Yes. The but, you know, again, I think if LMS is going to survive, they're going to have to incorporate that. They're going to have to open up. I think the future is cloud-based. The future is modules that can be plugged together rather than great big pieces of software. I, you know, I, I think we need something that can help us pull data out of learning. But what we don't want is to do that at the expense of everything else, which is yeah. flexibility, uh, uh, the good design, ease of access, you know, all of those things. So it's, yeah, we need everything. We need everything and we'll get everything eventually, but maybe not at the moment. I can't refrain from asking you about IT limitation. Yes. Um, I remember talking to you about uh, your role at the BBC. Yes. I remember you talking about your conversation with the IT people over there. Yes. And, you know, IT people on one side and your uh, boss at the other side who wanted yes. video. Yes. Uh, bandwidth is a problem these days. It's still a problem. Yeah, it is. Uh, but it's, it's a problem that is not, uh, it's not an absolute problem. It's a relative problem. What I mean by that is that people decide that they will not invest in better bandwidth. They make those sorts of decisions. They make them because of, you know, investment needs or prioritization or whatever it might be. There is plenty of bandwidth in the world for everybody. And there are plenty of, uh, plenty of capacity that could be given to any organization that wants it. Most of the fiber optic in the world is dark, believe it or not. Most of it is dark because when they lay cables, they don't give you the, they don't lay the cable that they need. They lay massive amounts of extra capacity for the future because it doesn't cost any more to do that or it costs a very marginal amount, amount more. And organizations, in organizations, we still have not really uh, got through the limits of Ethernet. We still are, are developing um, Wi-Fi protocols that are getting better and better with broader and broader bandwidth. So it can be done, but you need, you need a reason to do it. And what, what in the BBC, what I gave them was a reason to make the network a hell of a lot better. And they did it very quickly, relatively, very, very quickly. It took a few months, maybe two months, to do something that I, I've been told two weeks before was utterly impossible. It, so we're, we're no going one, back. No one believed it. So you, you, it has to be linked in, in bit. It's like storage, you know, that storage is infinite now. And yet the number of people who still operate in work environments with limits of, you know, megabytes, not even gigabytes. You know, they're told that they've got 250 megabytes of storage. But, you know, for goodness sake, how much is storage? It costs, it costs nothing. Nothing. Yeah, nothing. So technology is not an issue anymore. I don't think so. I, I think it's the attitude to technology is an issue. It's like, you know, that, that I still have arguments with people about we don't want iPads. iPads are insecure. We should never let them in our organization. So, right, okay, fine. The, the, the device or smartphones, we will not connect smartphones to our network. Fine, people have got them in their pockets. They mostly pay for them themselves. Yeah. And you're turning down the opportunity to leverage that goodwill and investment. You know, for me, I would say solve the problems of security in order to facilitate it, not use the excuse of security as a way of blocking and locking people out. No, no. It's what people want. It's the user experience. So, Again. We can't afford to have organizations which are like technological deserts 
and your home and your personal um, personal technological life totally different and much better and much more flexible. Now, the two have to be brought together much more readily than they are. And so I, you know, we're in a sort of temporary, um, awkward, unequal development phase where some organizations get it and some don't. But I, you know, I think you cannot stop bringing your own device. No one. No. It's just... It's just a, it's, it's absolute phenomenon. It will, it will take over in the vast majority of cases, vast majority of organizations, let it. I would say go with that flow and solve the problems that it creates, not dig your heels in. Because we, a kid. we want people to be comfortable with their technology and there's yeah. nothing more comfortable than the stuff that, they, that people use on a day-to-day basis. And, that and they, security yeah, has never been a, an IT issue. No. So security is not a technological issue. If we go back to this uh, spy story in the 50s where these American spies sold the, the atomic bomb or something yeah. like that, and that there was no internet at the time. No. Security has always been a trust issue, yes. the education issue. So we go back to that training thing. Yes. You, know, you said that you convinced your boss at the BBC because you clarified their need. Yes. So we're go be, going back to influencing again. Yes, exactly. Influencing. I think so. And, and lobbying and putting the case. But, but you know, working with what you've got as well, that, that if that's not going to happen at the moment, don't throw your toys out of pram. And there are ways of negotiating. For example, uh, I know a, l- a number of companies that have, uh, that the, the learning person has said, look, if we put learning in the cloud and took it out of the secure firewall area, it, it, what's the worst that can happen? Can we do that in order to create access for everybody wherever they want? And many organizations go, you're right. You know, there's not very much proprietary information here. There's not a lot of damage that could be done if, if, it, if it got out. And, and the point is that the cloud is incredibly secure. You know, I've, I've, I've never heard of anyone having any kind of security breach from salesforce.com. For example, have you? No. And you, you get much more breaches of security by lackluster internal IT people screwing up than you do from those big cloud-based organizations where security is their lifeblood. You know, the day that there's a breach in salesforce.com, the day their business is over. And they're, they're, you know, they have all of these thousands and thousands of companies all using the same data infrastructure None of it overlaps. You never log on to Salesforce and, oh my goodness, I've got Google's information here. It just doesn't happen. They, they no. don't do it. And even Dropbox, you know, people accuse Dropbox of being very vulnerable, but you know, I, I, people use Dropbox and I think Dropbox is absolutely brilliant. I love it. It is. And I, you know, I, you could give every member of staff Dropbox. You know, that it, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't cost anything at all or very little. And you've yes. got, suddenly you've got gigabytes of exchangeable common storage to share stuff. So the technology is important, but it's not the, the be all and end all. No. And the issues around technology are often not what you think they are. You know, that, that it's, no. it's often a, a, sub, a subjective decision by people that this is a problem rather than a, a truly objective um, yes. analysis of the fact. That's and it, it is sad that we focus on technology instead of focusing on, on the one technology that we'll always work at is the human brain. Yes, that's true. Uh, you said that there's no, there's no limit now to storage, data storage. At the same time, there's no limit for the brain. I mean, the, the kind of connection, the number of connections we could, we could add to a human brain is limitless too. Yes. We don't. Well, there is a there's a theoretical limit, but but you know that we've got a hundred billion neurons. You, know, you and each one of those, uh, uh, each neuron is capable of a thousand connections. So you you put a thousand times a hundred billion, and you you are talking pretty much limitless <laughs> capacity for the rest of your life. That's the other yeah. thing about the brain is it, it's it's nonsense that suddenly when you're forty your brain doesn't work anymore or fifty or sixty. No, no, it's the opposite. The, the point is that if you keep using your brain at 40, it will work better when you're 50. If you keep using it when you're 50, it will work better when you're 60. If you keep using it when you're 60, and so on. And, and yes. you know, I, I think there's a kind of moral responsibility among, amongst employers, employees, 
to look after their aging workforce and do the best by their brains. And in fact, they maintain their equipment a lot better yeah. than they maintain the brains of their employees. Yeah, exactly. And learning is, is a lot about you know, re retaining neuroplasticity and, and effectiveness as, a, as an employee. So, you know, to me, learning becomes more important as you get older, not less important. And, it's and that was, in most organizations, you, you get lots of development in your 20s, a little bit in your 30s. Yeah. After that, it's not worth it. Too late. It's That's all it. Rubbish. It's all rubbish. But then they do, they do maintain their equipment for years and years and years. We, we still have, you know, I, I work in, in manufacturing plants and I always see those very old machines from the 50s and the 60s that are well maintained and they still work. Yes. But in your book, you said that the, one of, you know, the best companies invest something like 4% of yes. their workforce yes. in, in maintaining the, the brain level at the right level. Yes. And 4% is a very minute number. Yes. If, you're, if you compare this to the amount they spend on new machines and repairs and all this. Yes. And in Quebec, we have a law that force, forces company to invest 1%. Yes. yes. Um, I was wondering about that. Have you ever heard of this? It's, it's a provincial law. We need to do it. If they don't do it, they need to write a check to yes. compensate for that. Yes. I think it's a very, very good law. It's very, 1%, not enough. We had, we had it in, in the UK, it was called a levy. And, and in certain industries, construction industry and others, there was a training levy. And that was dropped in the 90s or the, even in the late 80s as, because um, the companies moaned about it and they wasted the money that they spent. They, they fiddled the money, basically, so that they would buy stuff or do things and allocate it to that budget like <coughs> it wasn't a genuine it wasn't a genuine uh, investment in learning and development so that's why it went because it was it, the companies that did it well would have done it anyway and the ones that did it badly or did it under under duress did it badly anyway so you can yeah. to hell that's why yeah, we, but there's there's talk now that we that we, that they, we should bring it back that everyone should be entitled to it should be a kind of almost a, a workplace right to have personal development and it's not there that's not true for a vast vast numbers of the workforce and the smaller companies are usually worse at it than the larger companies that it's the big companies that tend to do it well so i, I think we're going to see a revolution i think that that's going to happen that, that we'll, people um from all sorts of different organizations, big and small, will begin to access the same um, level of, of development as bigger companies. And it's the technology that will help that. Because you, you're no and longer alone. You're no longer all on your own. No, because people will get whatever they need anyway on the net. They yeah. will go on the web and they will get it. If we could only find a way to document it, that you know, this, this employee spent three hours at home trying right. to find out you know, what was wrong with his work, Yes. But so far, we cannot document it. But if we were to document it, we would find that these hours are spent anyway by the employees because yes. everybody wants to improve. Yes. At least that's my firm belief. Yes. Not everybody, because I think some people are so disillusioned and, uh, and disengaged from work that, that, that they don't. But I, the vast majority, and I'm a great believer in the basically most people go to work wanting to do a good job and wanting yes. to do a better job. Uh, and most organizations disempower people and stop them from doing that. And th that's the sad thing. You know, th there was the survey in the UK which said that I think it was 76% of the people surveyed were willing to use their own technology to share information and share ideas and communicate. And only 22% of organizations made that possible. So there's a deficit of 50% of the workforce willing to do more and being told put that phone away you're not allowed to do that you can't use it. You, you can't send you can't send frivolous email you can only do your job and yeah it's 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 kind of crazy it, it makes me sad that people's lives are not uh, kind of being wasted and they could be so much better and so much healthier and so much more rewarding and feel so much better about their work and it's the organization that's screwing it up not yeah, you mentioned earlier 
You mentioned earlier that we needed more volunteers. We do have volunteers. We just, we're not letting them work. Yes, it's true. Exactly. Yeah. We're doing the opposite. You know, we're, 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 we're stopping them and then devaluing that contribution and undermining all of that. So no wonder people get fed up and depressed and, and don't put the effort in. You know, I, I, the, 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 the statistic seems to be that you know, roughly 60% of the workforce have much more to offer or 70% of the workforce could do much better than they're allowed yeah. to do. And Clay Sharkey talks about the cognitive human, surplus. Yeah, that, the, the human potential locked up in that and therefore the organizational potential, and therefore the profits, the innovation, the customer service, all of the things that could massively improve if we were to only unlock a few percent of them. And learning is the key, absolutely the key to this. Oh yeah, just look at Wikipedia. I mean, Wikipedia is hundreds of millions of hours freely given. Yes. So organizations could profit from that. Yes. And one of the things I, I noticed, and this is something I've written down, and you mentioned it, you talked about access. Uh, now with the web, with the technology, uh, we have access to everything. And I, I, I always compare this new way of doing things. Now we have access to things, whereas before in the 20th century, every, anything we were worried about was possessing. Yes. So it's possessing on one side and accessing on the other. And we've seen it with uh, Apple Music recently. Yes. We now have access to everything for $10 a month or $15 yes. a month. Whereas before everything was, I need to possess it. LMS is possessing the data. Yes. The web is accessing the data. Yes. yes. And I think that in your book, rereading it, I could see it throughout the whole book. Uh, you give example of companies using YouTube or YouTube-like system. It's a bank, if I remember correctly. Over there, um, just name the company. Uh, digital learning at the National Australia Bank. Yes, that's in Australia. Yes. Digital yes. type channel, and it's happening more and more now. Yes. So, again, it's providing access to data, providing yes. access to information, yes. and trusting people to use it the right way. Yes, and doing it very cheaply as well. You know, none, none of those examples at National Australia Bank were massively expensive. You have access to, you know, you can set up a video channel tomorrow. It doesn't cost you anything. And you can protect it. You can limit it to your own organization or to people you choose to allow in or whatever you want to do. It's amazing. It, you know, it is a world with this huge potential and it's sitting there and you think, why don't more organizations take advantage of it? They're crazy not to. And I think yeah. they will. I really think they will. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm not a pessimist. I'm an optimist. You know, I think yeah, me too. it's just time. It's just time. And, and, it, and we see the opening. We, we see that people used to be in their boxes and they would not dare to look outside of the box. Now they, they want to go outside of the box. And I think that I, I would like to, to finish this by quoting Frank Zappa, who said, a mind is like a parachute. If it does not open up, you crash. Yes. It's and true. I think organizations these days are slowly realizing that they are about to crash. Yes. Yes. I think it's absolutely right. And, and you know, that to extend it, that if organizations don't open the minds of their employees, then they're going to crash. You know, I, I think that's clearer and clearer and clearer. That it's, the world is too, even for simple companies doing, doing, you know, supposedly simple things, the world changes so fast that, that nothing is obvious in terms of the way forward. And how do you work out the way forward it, when you can't work it out, it's not obvious? You do that by debate, discussion, by opening up your mind, looking at possibilities, not by shutting it down or being told that you don't have this opinion or you've no right to do that. We're leaving that to the, you know, the, the, the top executives. They no longer can govern without the support and consensus and intelligence and engagement of the rest of the population. It's yeah. absolutely obvious to me. And I think it's very, very obvious by, learn, by reading your book, The Learning Challenge, that you provide a lot of insight this is the first part, which is really interesting. And you also provide uh, uh, helpful key points yes. and ways to change the organization, you know, yes. chapter by chapter. It's, very, it's a very, very good book. It's very easy to read. 
Thank it's you. very insightful, and I, I say that you know from my the, how do we say that the bottom of my heart. <laughs> After reading it twice and highlighting several things, it's an absolute must. I mean, I can't wait for part two. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm, writing, I'm, writing, I'm writing as we speak, yes. There will be another book. <laughs> it's going to be Great. out, but it won't be out till next year. Excellent. So I thank you very, very much, Nigel. Again, it's been a pleasure talking to you about the book no. and about learning in general. And the book is called The Learning Challenge. It's not The Learning Obstacles. It's a no, challenge. Exactly. exactly. And it, it's full of energy and uh, insights. So thanks That's again. Thank Have you. a great day. Merci bien. Thank you, Francois. Bye. Bye. So this will be a great thing.